Great. But here's what he did. Rhyme it. Do you know how to rhyme it? Oh, please just rhyme it. And he really gets into it. Do you actually. know how to rhyme it? Yes, of course. We will you don't even have to think about it. Like, so let's rhyme it today. Rhyme it. Yes. We are going to rhyme it. Just yeah, that's where he just that's where I like that. Everybody, amazing. I'm not gonna remember any of it. That's the way to go. All over the Rams today and Ram it. I mean, he, now he's like on his feet. How are you guys? Who's house? Wow. Ram it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rams Brothers, the pod. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined by the other host and my brother, Nick. And Nick, uh, Rams are three and six. Losses keep coming. How are you? I never thought we would be this bad. I'm wearing black mourning the loss of the Rams season. (laughs) Uh, I think if you surveyed 100 Rams fans before the season started, I don't think any single Rams fan or really just... I'm sure there were people around the league that believed there was going to be a legitimate Super Bowl hangover, but fans of the team to expect a three and six season, which is, you know, as severe as a Super Bowl hangover as you could have at this point in the year. So I don't know, Nick, what are your thoughts? Just coming right off of that game. Uh, you know, I know you have a headache. I know you're mourning the loss of the Rams this season, which I should probably be wearing black too. But how do you feel? Um, I think they have an argument to be made that they're the worst team in the league. Um, a hundred percent. I, the whole, I can't believe I was excited for backup quarterback play. Yeah. I don't know what you were excited for. I just thought maybe a little, you know, magic and whimsy and they went up against the backup quarterback. So you have a, you have a real shot. Kyler Murray's not even out there. And you lose 27 to 17 with a garbage time touchdown. Um, should have been worse. Way they worse. don't care. And it's hard for me to even care anymore because I don't think I, I, I think everybody's checked out. I think a majority maybe is checked out. I think the locker room is confused. Never been through this type of adversity. I think the head coach is confused. Obviously Sean McVay, I'm sure there was a ton of gibberish coming out of his camp as this game ended. You know, I have to take some accountability or you know, I have to make some kind of splash in terms of a fire to to set a fire in the locker room. You know what? Something has to change. Something has to give. It feels like over the past week, you know, he made the same kind of comments, it came out and did it all over again. And I don't feel like anybody in terms of Sean McVay or Raheem Morris deserved to be fired, but I wouldn't be against making a move to a coach on the staff to at least light a fire to a specific position group or at least to ignite the offense to get something else started because it seems like just so much inconsistency with play calling, right? There was like a little bit of read option you saw with John Wolford and Bryce Perkins. You saw the quarterback sweep early on, and then they revert back to their empty ways. And it's just, you know, there's so much shit that they're trying to throw at the wall just to see what sticks. And, uh, you know, all of it's falling straight down to the ground. Yeah, and to be a defense, like a solid defense that is able to keep you in games, um, like put this Rams defense on the Lions and they're maybe 8-1 and one right now. Um, to have that level of a defense that will be able to, like, you know, hold teams off from scoring big and then to continuously go three and out. Like if you're on that defense, what is driving you? At that point, I mean, I the Broncos must feel the same way. I saw a stat today that said the Broncos would be eight and one if the offense was able to score 18 points. <laughs> and now the Rams are in like the exact same position where it's like we have this good defense and we're doing nothing with it because we can't find ways to get the ball out fast. And it's yep. it's yep. incredibly frustrating. And I think more than anybody else, the blame has to go to to Sean. 100%. Yeah, this is a season where it feels like Sean McVay has to earn some of his money, right? Because when you're coaching without the personnel that you feel like you need to have in order to win games, coaching is what can elevate a team, right? A good game plan, solidified game plan across the board, complimentary football can help a head coach in that situation. And uh, there's none of that right now. It seems like there's disconnect. 
right? From the players to the coaching staff to the product that they're putting out on the field. It just feels like there's massive disconnect. And it doesn't feel like the Rams that we've covered over the last five years. It, it feels like a completely different team that we've been watching over the past nine weeks, 10 weeks. So there's some legitimate frustration to be had. But before, Nick, we go in any deeper, would you like to bring us a word from our sponsor? Because I think Nick's picks did okay over the weekend. Horrible. <laughs> it's really bad. Oh, we're just O for the weekend. Yeah, but let's uh, – yeah, Bet Online. Basketball is back, and Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting needs this season. You'll always find the latest odds, team matchups, info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. And as your continued source for all sports better and wagering, Bet Online features live betting, free contests, and giveaways all season long. Always the fastest, always the easiest. Bet all your favorite sports and events, whether that's NFL, NBA, NHL, MMA, tennis, boxing, or even putt putt golf, just regular golf. Head to betonline.ag to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure you use promo code BLEAV to receive your rewards. Bet Online, where the game starts. Uh, well, where the game ends is a loss in Rams' house. Yeah, apparently the energy in the stadium was that of a preseason game. And when you're putting together that crappy of a display, I do not blame the fans at all for that. Especially yeah. with, I mean, do you, a couple things that are on the tip of my mind, first of all being the backup quarterback project. And then the other is what I'm hearing from other fan bases right now on how McVay is kind of a fraud. And I'll it if you want, I can explain how that how that becomes a issue. Sure. Two, I feel like I feel like are massive cans of worms, especially the Sean McVay issue. But start with the first one. Feel free. I can't understand how you can have this bad of a backup quarterback when there are people in the league that have won Super Bowls that are backups. Nick Foles, Joe Flacco, people that are, when the situation presents itself, are ready to step into their roles to potentially secure a job. And then you have this kid, John Wolfer, coming out here, who's, as I like to call him, coach's son. Seems like he can do no wrong. Um, didn't Barely even played preseason. Seems like he should have lost his job to the third string. The Rams are carrying two quarterbacks, uh, three quarterbacks, and they're never using these guys. And it's, I, it just doesn't make sense. It's like, what, what are we doing with this kid? He has shown nothing. He is not an NFL-ready quarterback. I'm just going to naturally argue the counterpoint because I don't disagree with anything that you've said. But recently, I feel like there was some good exposure to what John Wolford's day-to-day -day is like. And it seems like there's a legitimate commitment to excellence when it comes to just what he does, what, how time he wakes up, the kind of schedule that he brings to himself. You know, all of the things that, you know, I feel like he's a very, very smart person. He's capable of understanding the offense. But from a basic skill level perspective, he is not a backup quarterback for a Super Bowl championship team. Like that's, he's not somebody that if you're starting quarterback, and especially if he's on the level of a Matthew Stafford or, uh, you know, a, a Patrick Mahomes or an Aaron Rodgers or, or a Tom Brady. Like, the, is that the backup that you would want in a situation where your starter has to come out? I, I totally understand where you're coming from, but I don't know. I, I, there isn't, I think, a legitimate counter argument to be made that he is worthy of having a job in the NFL as a quarterback. It's just maybe not specifically for the Los Angeles Rams. In, yeah. in, a, in a situation where, you know, you had some some luck with Matthew Stafford, Last year, where it seemed like he was battling four or five different types of injuries throughout the season, battling a concussion this season, battling a phantom elbow injury, you know, battling just bruises from the entire season. It would be nice to have a legitimate backup in that situation who isn't, you know, somebody that you have to completely change the offense for in order for the game plan to work. And you saw that a little bit in the first scripted series, but. It's, it's not who you'd want. And maybe it's not Joe Flacco. It's probably not Nick Foles at this point in his career. But there has to be somebody else that, that you could bring in that could at least give you a legitimate shot to win this game. The throws that he made, putting his, his receivers in danger, like that's not the kind of quarterback that you want to be on the field in any situation. Yeah, I think he actively makes everyone around him worse. <laughs> and... 
yeah, puts them in a position to fail. Because even after the ball is caught, you're you're uh, completely getting lit up. And he's running around back there, like making these throws on the run. And to be honest with you, I don't care how early this guy wakes up and trains and preps his mind. If you don't have it, you you just don't have it. The quarterback yeah. is is a position where only like at any given time, 12 to 15 people do it amazing. And then the gap from there is huge. And he's yeah. – He's. I don't even know if he would start for an XFL team. To be honest with you, maybe. Um, but yeah, it just. It also just kind of makes me more upset because there was a huge group of Rand fans that were just saying this kid's like a starter, and it just yeah. made me think I was crazy. And I'm like, where are we? What are we looking at, guys? And he had to beat Colt McCoy. He had to look better than Colt McCoy, and he looked. Colt McCoy looked compared to him like a starting quarterback in the NFL, and Wolfer was just abysmal garbage. I have no. I, last week, I, I I found the positive lane. I can't find anything positive this week. No, I, yeah, there's nothing to find specifically positive. And then transitioning to your other point about Sean McVay being a potential fraud. I mean, the counter argument's always going to be he's a Super Bowl champion. Like, he did everything he needed to do last year. He coached his team through adversity through the second half of the Super Bowl without Odell, uh, without Odell Beckham Jr. on the field. He did it. He accomplished the main goal. He beat San Francisco last year. He I don't, I don't specifically think he's a fraud, but there I think there are – you know, scenarios where people in media or friends or whomever it may be could draw the kind of comparison to John Gruden, right? Where it's, you know, he has success in his first four to five years, obviously not to the level that Sean McVay has had success, transitions over to broadcast after he wins his first Super Bowl, and then isn't the same kind of head coach because the league moves by you so quickly. I, I don't, like, I understand where the comparison comes from, but I'm, I feel obligated to defend the head coach that brought us back to these times to even be able to exist in this time period again. You know, like, yeah, no, I agree. I look, and this is just what I'm hearing. And it, and the take only exists in a bubble as if the years prior with Goff don't exist at all. Sure. Um, but the argument is he convinced the owner to go out and get a like rent a quarterback for a year, bring in all these pieces. Um, he had like how many of the top 10 players last year on his team? Um, Great. Yeah. And then, like, you, you know, on top of that, you bring in Odell halfway through, you bring in Von Miller. And it's like, well, yeah, with that roster, you know, Mike McCarthy could win a Super Bowl as a head coach. And now you're back on planet Earth this year. And you have similar type guys and you're not doing anything with it. And yeah, yeah. it's teams are winning with less. So yeah, it's, it's, time so to, it's time to kind of, you know, not move on from him at all. But well, the no, argument is just saying that he has to grow and he, totally. he's refusing to. And you know what? Like there are comparisons that can be made to like a Mike Tomlin or an Andy Reid, but guys like Mike Tomlin or Andy Reid, have had long sustainable track records of winning teams and winning records year in and year out. Like McVay hasn't necessarily earned that right yet. Those are both guys. Mike Tomlin has two Super Bowls. Andy Reid has one. I don't think Mike Tomlin's ever had a losing season. This could be his first one coming up. Yeah. So, and then you look at what Andy Reid does in Kansas City year after year after year, which makes me think that it, like Sean McVay, I understand why there's outside criticism from somebody that hasn't been watching from the day he turned 31 all the way until now, and he's 36 and has a Super Bowl ring in his back pocket, but is now also married and wants to start a family and potentially move on to a more lucrative career that is less stressful. Like, I totally can understand why people can nitpick in that area, but there, I think there's a legitimate obligation to defend what he has brought to the table so far. Yeah, and especially as a Rams fan. Absolutely. And also, I just want to say that was not like I'm not pushing that argument at all. It sure, should, no, but understand yeah. why it's there. Yeah. It's what you're going to hear, I think. It's what I've been hearing, like, as a Rams fan. It also, I mean, it just goes to show how difficult it is to win a Super Bowl, the fact that here we are now. Um, yeah. So, to me, it honestly, this year makes me even more grateful that that we've been under this regime with, uh, you know, him and Sneed for as long as we did. How yeah. about Sneed pivoting after Jeff Fisher, too? Yeah, I mean, that's uh... – 
a career resurgence if I've ever seen one. And it it did feel like after the trade deadline, them not making a move almost solidified like maybe we don't feel like we can go all in this season. And yeah. I didn't want to believe that, but in hindsight, it kind of makes sense. Well, it's it's really interesting because if you go back to what, 2014, 2015, where those are the two consecutive years where Aaron Donald and Todd Gurley were drafted. So, you know, by the time 2014 or 2024 rolls around, you know, you're now on a 10 year cycle from, you know, that what happened back then. But if less seed is still in the building, you know, you have potential first round picks that you could potentially rebuild the core of your team for the next three to five years with those picks. And, you know, I don't know if it's going to be established for the draft. And this is stuff we'll talk about later on when we get to our hashtag Monday pain segment. But like there's a lot I think that you could do to address this team and rebuild it fairly quickly. You know, you look at teams year year to year. Uh, I mean, it's just the improvement, the Bengals from the year prior to last year and the Eagles, their resurgence and the Vikings after they fire a head coach. Like if you have a good core and the Rams do have that, that they've essentially promised it through this year and potentially next year, then I think that there's an opportunity to rebuild it from the inside out, but not technically label it as a full rebuild, if that's fair. Yeah, I mean, it's just really difficult, too, because the Lions now have our pick. So yeah. regardless, pick yeah. yeah, so the first round talent that would become in a year like this and kind of chalk it off as a rebuild. Yeah, I'm saying it for next out. year. Yeah, for yeah. 2024 when we finally get the first round picks back, if we don't end up trading them. And it's another reason why I trade like Christian McCaffrey. Like if we would have had him on our team, we would have had no draft capital and probably less than a 500 record. So, it's, yeah. yeah, you know, some things happen for a reason, but I, I don't know, like when I watch this offense and I will get to the offense, then we'll get to the defense. I want to start with the offense. So, because we already kind of talked about John Wolford and Bryce Perkins, uh, you don't rotate two quarterbacks unless you're a college coach one or two, you have Steve Montana or Steve Young and Joe Montana. Like that is, you know, the Bill Walsh special when you feel like you have two guys you know, and then they could both potentially play like Joe Montana, I think was coming off of a back surgery and Bill Walsh was selling to Steve Young that Joe Montana could no longer play, which is why he agreed to come join the 49ers. And then they have this quarterback controversy and it becomes the most interesting dynasty, you know, and one of the most interesting dynasties in the history of football. And it was a dynasty that Sean McVay happened to be a fan of. Right. So this quarterback rotation thing is not something that is necessarily going to work when you have two guys at that talent level but also like you know it's just it's it's there's no rhythm there's no continuity with this offense there's no momentum like the draw the series nick after the first series the first offensive series when 14 plays for 57 yards was capped off by a field goal the entire game plan after that was just awful like the next three next five drives ready for this three plays four yards and a punt next drive Three plays, negative one yard, and a punt. Next drive, three plays, negative one yard, and a punt. And then the drive after that, four plays, 10 yards, and a fumble. And J.J. Watts should have scooped and scored. And then the play, the series right before the half, one play, negative one yard, kneel down. That's your first half of football. 68 total yards from the Rams' offense. Like, that's yeah. how much this league changes so quickly. And, you, you know, you're missing – Matthew Stafford and you're missing Alaric Jackson and it's the 10th rotation for the offensive line in 10 weeks. It's, it's aggravating, but it's also like you could come to the table with excuses for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Part of me believes that. And I know I just got done crapping all over Wolford, but <laughs> I don't really know how much better this team is. If you plug in Matthew Stafford on this day, you know, like maybe yeah. they, they can muster enough to, uh, to you know, keep this more competitive, but I mean, Wolford's pick and then the fumble with zero pocket awareness kind of you know solidified the game. Um, so the argument is made that Stafford probably puts you in a better better position. Um, I mean, obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. and it's just uh, seeing that and reading that. Three plays, four yards punt. It just felt like every time I was, I I checked, it was a three and out, and it was just, it was horrible. 
Yeah. And I watched I watched the highlights back today, and I'm just like, did I miss anything? Is there anything that stood out as like impressively horrible? And in the highlights, you only get to see that because they're not going to show these three and outs. And then mainly, yeah. mainly it's Wolford's disgusting decisions. The one thing that I realized was I saw a lot of cans, like tons of cans at the line of scrimmage. So many audibles, like that to me just reads uncertainty and a lack of preparation, right? Because if the defense is in a specific alignment in a specific scheme and you weren't prepared to go up against that front or that second level or whatever kind of shell the defensive backs are, are set up in, you know, that's where you're, you're trying to audible. Maybe you're trying to keep the ball on the ground instead of making a big mistake. And like, I, I feel like I was seeing that every other play between one quarterback and the other. And I don't know if that's an issue with the play calling, if the the quarterback is disagreeing with the offensive coordinator, which is a, a strong likelihood. Like, it's just, it's a total mess. Cooper Kupnick in this game, three receptions, negative one yard. When was the last time you saw, have you ever even seen that? No. And then the and, and then he goes down and it's, you know, it's who is Stafford going to throw the ball to next week? Robinson exclusively. Yeah, if he even plays. If Stafford yeah. even plays. Yeah. Right. I just assumed that he was going to play again. I mean, at this point, the season's like we're, we're three point dogs in New Orleans. New Orleans. That just tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. Yeah. It sure does. And it also makes me think that he could potentially sit out another week if the concussion is legitimately bad or, you know, maybe they just don't feel like, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. He's going to be reevaluated this week. See if he has any other injuries. If there's, you know, legitimate reasons to keep him out in this game, then they probably will. Um, but I don't, I mean, you'd expect Matthew Stafford to be playing in this game, I would think. Just the offense was nauseating. The running back situation is completely pathetic. I saw a stat uh, on Twitter today, trying to remember who it was from, 33rd, 33 teams or whatever that account is, is called. Um, I don't think a single rusher throughout this season has had more than 65 yards in a game. 61, I think, is the top total for a single running back. Oh, and I got people texting me. Should I pick up uh, Williams, Kyrie Williams? Yeah. And I said, for the love of God, please don't do that if you care about winning at all. And then they do it, and I'm like, well, you didn't listen to me. Yeah. So the, Rams, the Rams can't run the ball. They can't. It doesn't matter who's back there. Yeah, and I, it's when you watch Kyron Williams, too, in garbage time, he wasn't even featured in the offense until the fourth quarter when they were in garbage time. So, like, you're talking him up all this week. He's coming back from injury. He looks like he could potentially be the guy. And you don't even really let him play. And then, he, he like, the only evaluation you can come away with what you saw from Kyron Williams in the end of this game was he looks good. That's it. Yeah. Nothing else can be said about him because you haven't seen enough of him, which is just so, so excruciating. And the Cooper Cup injury, Nick, I know you touched on it too. It's just gut-wrenching for me to watch. To see him on the sidelines with the whole staff around him and players around him and a towel over his leg, like that is – it's legitimately my worst nightmare as a Rams fan next to seeing Aaron Donald go down. And it, it's it's all because John Wolford decided to throw a ball to 20 feet above Cooper Cup's head and Marco Wilson decided to go low, which I thought was completely unnecessary. but. Like that was the that was the knife in the heart. Like that was your nail in the coffin. Was that moment in this game? All the all the fun, all the magic, everything felt like it came crashing down in the moment where he was lying on the sideline. I mean, that's why mainly I'm so upset about Wolford because you're putting players in positions to get hurt, and you completing a pass. In that moment, I know that's what you're like supposed to do, but overthrowing that much and jeopardizing like the franchise, you know, like Cooper Cup is that guy. Yeah. Uh, like I want him off the team today, and I know that's not <laughs> that that's not going to happen. But I'm um, Nick. How often are we talking about quarterbacks who make throws that are so bad that it's actually putting our players, our best players, in harm's way? I think this is the only time. <laughs> I don't think we've ever talked about that before. This is episode 145, and this would be the very first time we've talked about a quarterback making throws that were so poor they were putting our players in harm's way. Yeah. I'm very actually bad. shocked 
he didn't do worse. This is exactly what I thought was going to happen. I, for some reason, I convinced myself he wasn't going to play. I was like, he's going to do bad, and they're going to put Perkins in. But that's not what happened. <laughs> there are some moments in this game where he looked like he was a capable preseason backup. I was 24 36 for 212 yards, touchdown interception. You know, statistically not the worst day ever. Jimmy Garoppolo. Touchdown. Take away that touchdown, though. Yeah, I was going to say, and Jimmy Garoppolo wins that that game with no touchdown passes, 22 to 16. So I watched it last night. I watched it happen against the Chargers. And same freaking stat line and wins the game 22 to 16 with no touchdown passes. And an amazing O-line and three great running backs. Absolutely disgusting. And speaking of amazing O-line, Ty Nasecki, Nick for us, left tackle, left guard, Coleman Shelton, center, Brian Allen, right guard, Chandler Brewer, right tackle, Rob Havenstein, 10th offensive line combo to start a game in the last 10 games for the Rams. I'm not even sure what to say about this unit at this point. Allen and Havenstein are the two pieces remaining from the Super Bowl. They combined for seven pressures. No big deal. Just seven. And then Allen, I think, allowed five on his own. And I don't even know what to say just about this entire unit because it's it's really hard to evaluate. But I think the main question is when I watch this offensive line and I watch this offense in general, if we weren't bit by the injury bug, was their personnel even good enough up front to be a top tier team? Yeah, yeah, I know. That's the question. I don't think so. I, I don't I, think so either. Yeah. I legitimately I don't. don't. <laughs> I know. But I, I convinced myself that it was. I got all you know excited for the year like an idiot. So no boom, left tackle, Edwards at left guard, Allen at center, Coleman Shelton at right guard, Rob Havenstein at right tackle. That was your starting offensive line. I mean, David Edwards had a concussion, got, had back-to-back -back weeks where he got a concussion. Nobody's even heard of him since. I don't think he's been on the practice field. Like, just horrible, horrible situation. And no boom, Achilles tear, whatever it was. Like, I mean, just you're just cooked. That whole unit is just cooked. Oh, you want to transition over the defense? Yeah, yeah. Because, I, you know, there were some things I liked in this game. There were. Do we want to start all, with that? It was all defensively. I we've. Tr it seems like we've struck a deal with the devil on some yeah. level. It's like you win the Super Bowl. Following year, welcome back to St. Louis. <laughs> all you care about is watching uh, defensive drives. That's all. It's the only thing you can enjoy. Yeah. Well, I mean, I felt like there were a couple that you could have enjoyed. Tons of three and outs. I thought this stat that Jordan shared in her um, her most recent write-up for The Athletic, I thought was so interesting on complimentary football. And the Rams' response to when the defense forces a three and out. Ready for this? I don't know if you are. When the Rams' defense forces a three and out, entering the, the game where they played against Cardinals, they had the 10 most in, in the league. The offense responds 39% of the time with their own three and out according yeah. to true media, which absolutely has to be the highest rate out of any team throughout this season. And you know what? I'm shocked. It's not like 50. I know. It's what it feels like. Yeah, absolutely does. Whenever the defense, you know, forces a three and out or, or makes a big play or gets off on a third and long or gets off on a third and short or really does anything good. feels like the offense will just revert back to three and out three plays, negative one drives and let's punt it away. Yeah, like, I, I feel I, like uh, I feel like Liza Minnelli in Cabaret when she sings, maybe this time. Because I, I convince myself every time. I'm like, oh, great defensive stop. Maybe this time we'll be able to do something. Maybe no. this time. Yeah, I'll maybe be not happy. This time. Definitely not, Liza. <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. Um, what else? What else did I have? Oh, the Ben Don't Break defense, of course. Um, it's, um, uh, it's perfect when the offense is producing offense. Those are my thoughts. If the offense is productive mm -hmm. and can control time of possession and put points on the board, it forces opposing offenses to take more shots downfield, be more forceful and inevitably make more mistakes. That's what the bend don't break defense does. Yeah. And when you don't have an offense, you're just bend and eventually break. Yeah, it, this is the defense from last year that was able to keep us in these tight games. It's like the offense struggles. Defense is like, okay, we're going to step up, but yep. you guys got to eventually bring the thunder. 
And then they ended up being able to do that a time and time again. But this defensive model doesn't work for this team because you have to have a perfect defensive model Mm -hmm. for this team because you can't give up more than 10 points because that's all our offense is capable of doing. Well, we've seen it now. And over the last, I think, three or four weeks, Nick, I don't think they forced a turnover on defense. And you could tell that if one or two of those turnovers went our way, it could change the entire complexity of the game. But that's what the defense is relying on because the offense isn't capable of putting any points on the board. Which is yeah. truly why it's it's so frustrating is if you miss an interception, like defensive backs drop interceptions all the time. But if you miss one and you drop one, you know, you're putting your offense then in jeopardy to then eventually just put the defense back on the field because they can't produce any type of yardage, any type of continuity, any type of momentum. And it's again, it's uh, if I were the defense, Nick, if I were Jalen Ramsey or Bobby Wagner or Ernest Jones or or Aaron Donald standing on the sideline. I would be like, when is our offense going to do something? Yeah, that's do. why I I believe that – because up until this week I thought the defense is bringing it. But I watched this game and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, what are they bringing it for? You know? Right. Like, right. When is it going to give up? Yeah. Like why are they going to continue to care when you're chugging out abysmal, mediocre, crappy – offensive football and you're supposed to have one of the smartest minds in the entire league Mm -hmm. and i know there's a backup i'm tired of i'm tired of excuses honestly especially because this is the backup that you've had for years in and year out yeah i mean i like raheem morris i i do i think he's a good defense coordinator i think he's as good of a coach as todd bowles will be in tampa bay or you know whoever any other kind of new head coach, uh, Raheem Morris has been around football long enough, way longer than Jeff Saturday as a head coach or as a coach <laughs> rather, you know, somebody who could just, you look across the league, Brandon Staley, uh, Mike McDaniel, like a lot of these guys don't necessarily have this, this long withstanding relationship as a coordinator, as a head coach, like Raheem Morris, I, I want the best for him. And I want him to, to go off and go coach, get a, an, an upgrade, get a promotion, Go be a head coach of, an, of another team. And in return, we'll get you the third round compens- compensatory pick. So, you know, we would get a pick. We need to be back. We need another pick in the third round in this draft. And Raheem could go be a head coach somewhere else. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, I think it's going to happen. I think he gives the, I mean, the way Jalen Ramsey talks about it, it seems like he gives them a lot of freedom yes. to, to, to be – Um, You know, the kind of guys that can make these big plays and it's like, okay, like give up a 20 yard chunk play. It's all right. You get to the end zone. They don't know what's coming because you guys are all going to have it figured out. And then when you have somebody like Weddle, who's able to, you know, kind of like be the men amongst men and dictate, it's going to, you know, it's going to really work out and Mm -hmm. Ramsey as well. And it has been working, but the other side of the football is a dud. So there's nothing yeah. that can be done to to produce anything. I mean, maybe they could be a little, you know, more like turnover intensive, but that, yeah. you know, that's part of that is luck. Well, it's and that's a really good point that you bring up too. Like Ramsey talked about how he they he wants Raheem Morris wants his defensive backs to be able to play with freedom. Like it's totally a scheme that can force turnovers. I don't think the the methodology is bad. I don't think the scheme is bad. You know, it allows the players to to make mistakes, right? There's a lot of judgment calls. They have to make last second adjustments. They have to see what kind of alignment the offense comes out in. If players are moving at the line of scrimmage, like there's a lot of of mental math and gymnastics that you're doing throughout that entire process. All the pre-snap stuff. There's so much going on, but it feels like uh, when the when the opposing offense is on the field for longer periods of time, like they're naturally going to be worried about letting up an explosive play when their offense can't put any points on the board. So it allows you to kind of like tighten up a little bit and play scared because you don't have any, (laughs) there's no guarantee that the offense is going to be able to, to come out and score and, and give you guys a breather. Like the next thing, you know, you're going to be right back on the field. And while you're trying to not allow explosive plays, you're simultaneously allowing other things to happen. And 
are capable of making mistakes because you know the other side, the other complement to your team doesn't have your back. Yeah. And they continue to show that they, you know, they can't have it. We're Reg- like, regardless of if they're going out there and they're trying, they're not getting the ball out faster, fast enough. And the, and the offense is struggling time and time again. And without change, nothing can happen. And it's nope. just really, really stubborn that they're not doing anything to change what, what, what used to work. And that's why it's so frustrating. It certainly is frustrating. Um, and you know what, too? Like the pass rush, that would have been something that I felt like they should have in maybe invested a draft pick to, or maybe just invested more in the draft instead of who did they? They had Chris Garrett, they had Daniel Hardy, right? All these like freak athletes that they kind of sold us this, this lie of Bill of Rights that was just a lie on these guys that can't even get on the field. Chris Garrett was cut before the season even started. And like the pass rush is perhaps the worst I've seen in the last 10 years. Like, I, I mean, it's by far the worst that they've had with Aaron Donald on the starting defensive line. Leonard Floyd, Justin Hollins, Terrell Lewis, like they're up against two out of five backups, three out of five backups. I'm trying to think who didn't play in this game. There were two offensive linemen that didn't even play in this game. DJ Humphreys and Max Garcia. And what do our pass rushers do? You know, they, they're sitting back. They're enjoying their cup of coffee. They're not getting to the quarterback ever. And it's just like, I don't even know. How many pressures have the three of them gen- generated on the entire season? 15? For three players? Four each, maybe? <laughs> it's painful. It is, uh, yeah. It's becoming a problem. It, Defense, yeah. Defense it has reached that. problem point, and now you're not doing anything about it, and you're just sitting in your in your problem. Yep. In yep. your mistakes. Yeah. I mean, somebody speaking of somebody that's sitting in their mistakes too. David Long Jr. The, it's it seems like that outside defensive back position that's not Troy Hill, that's not Jalen Ramsey, that second or third, whatever you want to consider it. David Long over Darion Kendrick was the call on Sunday, as Raheem Moore had alluded to before the game even started. And you saw Russ Yeast sub in for uh, Taylor Rapp, who was injured. But both positions, I feel like we're just heavily underlooked when it came to talent when they evaluated all of this prior to the season starting, like it seems like nobody could step into that position whatsoever. AJ green reestablished his dominance early on, made a catch over David long's head to set the tone in this game. And now is a history of just dominating David long. And then that, that series, Nick, I think the one defensive series that really was the killer in this game was that third and 17 that they converted on or got to the, you know, the inch yard line where it was fourth and one or fourth and two where David Long missed a tackle on that third and 17, and then he was beat down the sideline on the fourth down play by Rondell Moore. And it's just why, it's exactly why, you know, a lack of continuity, a a lack of any momentum at a specific spot, a specific position can just kill you. I mean, it could really just eat you up for lunch. And that's what happened in this game. Yeah. It feels like over and over again, This year, we're sitting here and we're trying to praise the defense. We're like trying to give them things to, to like for, for us to hold on to and be like, well, it's not all bad. And I can't, I can't sit here and, and, and lie. No, I know. (laughs) It's, it's sad. It's becoming a very sad show. And I think we need to move on because the more we talk about this game, the more I'm just going to make myself upset. Okay, well, Monday pain is coming right up after this quick commercial break. Liquid Death, Nick, have you heard of Liquid Death? I I have. I I listen to the Rams Brothers. Oh, great. You've heard. Awesome. Plug in the promo code, and uh, maybe we'll sign on to a long-term sponsorship with Liquid Death. We We love that. We absolutely love that. Send me a case. (laughs) Yeah. We'll be, yeah. We'll case race. Me versus you, six versus six. There's a new water brand out there. And you may have heard of it. If you're listening to Rams Brothers the Pod, you've definitely heard of it. It looks like a tall boy. It's actually just a mountain spring water that's available and still sparkling and three flavors. It's liquid death. There's something about drinking water out of a can, Nick. Uh, my friends all tell me it's very refreshing when they drink it. I myself enjoy it. I went, I was running errands the other day and I, I saw it in Target. I picked it up. Cold can, 
right in the driver's seat, was enjoying myself. I was fooling the cops, I was fooling all the grandmoms that were driving past me. Everybody, you could just fool everybody, pretend that you're drinking a beer, but in actuality, you're drinking a liquid death. So if you need a liquid death, go to your local Whole Foods, Ralph's, Albertsons, Vons, or 7-Eleven, or find a liquid death at a retailer near you with the store locator tool at www.liquiddeath.com slash LAFB. For all your water needs, go to the Rams Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Monday pain, Nick. This is a new segment. It's a uh, frequent segment. This is, yeah, this is now three weeks in a row. We've done Monday pain, hashtag Monday pain. If you want to get your responses read on Rams Brothers the pod, hashtag Monday pain, and we will perhaps read it on any given episode. Nick, I'm going to let you start with the first one because it comes from a good buddy of ours and somebody we've actually had on the podcast. You ready for it? Mm -hmm. This oh, one Seattle. is from Rob. Seattle Ram. Simple. His response to us. A lot of angst, even more alcohol, and rooting for everyone the Niners play like I have been a card-carrying fan of that team, whoever they are, my entire life. What what was our lead-up? I feel like I should read what, what Rehead wrote first. Ah, okay. Give me one second. I'll pull that right up. <laughs> Wait, I can read it. I can read it. Okay. If you have it, feel free. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I have it right here. Right here, looking for it. <laughs> Let's hear the magic. Oh, wow. How many times have we tweeted since? None. Oh, really? It's the last tweet? It is. No, it's not. Not the most recent tweet. Regardless, we're talking about why people are in pain. What's next for the Rams? So it's essentially the question. What are you doing now to handle okay. the pain of yeah. the Rams? So go I ahead. feel like our, our listeners are probably like, wait, what's going on? Respond um, to good friend Rob. I am wholeheartedly on your side. I don't know. I don't want to be rooting against the Niners because they're a great team. I don't want to be more oh, no. upset. No, I don't want to be more upset and, like, you know, root for the Chargers and then the Chargers lose against the Niners. And now I'm, like, even more pissed, which is where I was last night. So – while I agree with your sentiment, I'm not going to be seeking out Niners games to watch because they piss me off so much. And oh, no, totally understand that, right? I'm not going to sit there and watch every second of a 49ers game. I will check in with games. I will watch them as I have the opportunity to. Like last night, they were on Sunday Night Football, and I needed to clear my head after what I had just watched. So I turned that game on after 10 o'clock. I was watching the beginning of it, and obviously San Francisco comes away with the win. Justin Herbert was dicing them up in the first half. But uh, yeah, no, I, my favorite team is the Rams and my second favorite team is anybody who's playing against the 49ers. Like that's how much we hate the 49ers. Yeah. Nobody and I, I said it last week. I'll say it again. I, I like, um, I like Seattle and I really want them to beat Brady. And yeah. They're a game. different team this year. They're not the Russell Wilson, Pete Carroll. They're Geno yeah. Smith and, and Pete Carroll and capable of making a mistake against Tom Brady in any given moment. seems like. It's tough. I, I'm not rooting for any team in the NFC West. We talked about potential contenders of teams that will quote unquote pull for Minnesota's one, Philadelphia's one, potentially Buffalo's maybe one. And then anybody who's playing against the 49ers will occupy our headspace. Yes. Next one. I'll, I'll take the Liberty. Thank you. Um, from Tonji, Tonji Nudson at birdie girl 13. Long time listener, first time caller. No, she actually wrote, <laughs> dump our OC. Anybody could do better. Play Kyron, who showed a spark and a small glimmer of hope for the run game. Also add some edge help. If you can find anyone available, start your mock drafts early. Uh, the last line, I think, is the best, right? Because I saw some people starting to start their mock drafts, and it's just total insanity. Right. That's like the craziest type of behavior that you could display in November and not something that we've had to do. You know, it's like you're coming back into this old world where you were so excited over top prospects and you can't even really do that this year because they don't even have the picks. This is a this is a first for the Rams brothers. Every season they have been manageable, at least. 
And mostly, they made the postseason pretty much every time. Now we're sitting here talking about mock drafts in November. <laughs> I mean, we lost more games this year than we did last year already. Yep. And I'm sitting here, and I'm like looking at these other bad teams, and I'm like, we would lose to the Steelers. We would mm-hmm. lose to the Lions. Like, we would lose to the Browns. Like, at least they have things to hold their hats on. Mm-hmm. Young quarterback, you know, kind of still rebuilding. Um, Deshaun's coming. You know, like, w- we have none of that right now. Like, even yeah. next year, I don't even know what to be looking – I guess health. But – like we said, the offensive line, even when healthy, what what is it going to be good at? You know, Dude, the, the roster turnover is going to be severe. Yeah, I mean, they're going to clean house. Yeah, I mean, players like Tutu Atwell, who was a healthy scratch. Oh wait, hold on. Here we go. Adam Scheffner, eight minutes ago. Rams wide receiver Cooper Cup suffered a high ankle sprain Sunday versus the Cardinals. Per one source, another familiar. With the prognosis said, it doesn't sound good. Well, it's a high ankle sprain. It's not a, a broken leg. It's not a broken ankle. But a high ankle sprain, you know, probably will require surgery if they're saying it doesn't sound good, which will make it season ending. Kyron, I think Kyron Williams had a high ankle sprain in the beginning of the season on the first play of the game. Required surgery, was out for eight weeks. The best part about that is Cooper Cup will be as good as new next year. And the guy who's in first place in our fantasy league will no longer be in first place. Who is it, Ojo? It's Ojo. He's in trouble. That's good for us. Yeah. Our five five and five records. Just clawing at the bottom of the standings. Yeah, very, very sad. Our our 20% playoff hopes. Yeah, FML. All right, next one, all you. Okay. Stat Padford is my Super Bowl QB at... LAF Kako Panamer. <laughs> you gave me this one on purpose. <laughs> ben and... oh, I had to. Oh, God. I feel like popcorn reading at school. <laughs> oh, it's honestly time for McVeigh to make a statement fire. A message needs to be sent to this team. Last year is over and nobody cares anymore. That is exactly how I feel. I want Cohen, Liam Cohen. And John Wolford. I want their their bankers' boxes packed with their LinkedIn profiles ready to go because both of these guys have to hit the road because they are dead weight. And just give play calling back to McVeigh 100%, even though I'm sure he probably has it. I don't even know. I don't even think – he. I really don't even think he cares that much anymore. Yeah, well, it's like – Don't it's, get married, you're, kids. You're, yeah, yeah. You lose you're all in, drive. You're in a situation where uh, you just want to point fingers, right? John Wolford's the easy guy to point fingers at. He's not the reason why this team is three and six. No, no, no. no. But, Even a little bit. But Liam Cohen, maybe it's a it's a statement. Yeah, right. It would be. A, I think it would be a statement to fire the offensive coordinator. I mean, really, you go from worst to first, you get fired. It's the it's the facts of the league. Oh, you like to pal around with Wolford at the water cooler? Personality higher? Boom. Gone. Doesn't get a job. I don't think he would get a job on another team. Uh, Wolford? I think he would. Really? Camp it would be a camp arm, would be a third guy. Maybe a second yeah, guy. Yeah, but most people don't carry three quarterbacks. I mean, he's like a Case Keenum or a Chase Daniel, but I guess on that level below. You know, he's level really below. not even quite that. Yeah, sad, sad. Lower McVay's, than Colt McCoy, which is McVay's a little project. Yeah, I like Cole. you know what was funny about Colt McCoy, Nick? We read his stat lines in games that he played in last year, and the stat line in this game was identical to the stat lines that we read off this year. Like I totally expected. I'm just All waiting for like, Cole McCoy to throw us one, and of course it just doesn't happen. No, no, he's not that kind of guy. It's good backup. Could be the next Geno Smith. All right, Nick, this one's all you. Okay. LVI Rams tweets. Bringing back OBJ to immediately fill the void of Cooper Cup. Finish the season 10-7 and give yourself a chance. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, that's probably the most optimistic tweet I've read all day. So I wanted it to be on the pod, but OBJ is not coming back. 
just he's not even no... you can't even bet on him to be a Ram anymore. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I mean he went from plus two hundred all the way to out of the out of the standings. There's what six teams? Right now, you can't even bet on them. So I'm gonna go Bills, Bucks, Giants, Packers, Chiefs, Niners. Those are the six. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I think I think he goes Bills. Yeah, I, I do too. I think he goes Bills. Or if I were him, I would just go Kansas City. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I I would take over the role of uh, I think Juju Smith just got knocked out of a game. Right, you could rotate in the slot. You could steal some. Yeah, of but how about the uh, snaps? Tony. Tony's yeah, looking I mean, good. Tony's Tony's not Odell Beckham Jr. No, you know? he's, a, he's a hunk for sure. He's a good player. You know, yeah, but I mean, he they have Tony and they have Odell Beckham Jr. and they have Travis Kelsey and and they they're going to go win another Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, they're they're going to get. I mean, what Mahomes is going to get one in his career? No shot. They'll get another one. Yeah, and, I, and I want to see him. I do want to see him get another one too. Yeah, and I'd like to see it on a year where we're not. We're definitely not going to get one. Right, right. And um, them or Buffalo, I think I would have no ill will. Everybody so, else, I'd be sick to my stomach. Before we go into another one, no, I wouldn't be sick if like New York or Minnesota won. Um, yeah, but if Minnesota and or the or the Niners win again, I'd be sick. Uh, Minnesota is the 2018 Rams. Buffalo are the 2021 Rams. And they're going through their November, their November right now, their winless November. I'll tell you what, Minnesota versus Buffalo would be an awesome Super Bowl. After what we saw yesterday? Was that the I best mean, game? Was that was the best game I've ever seen? Best no. regular season game. Rams Monday night, Kansas City. I don't dude. I mean, obviously that was high scoring, but that was just, I've never seen anything like that happen in football games ever. I, I mean, to make that catch, contort your body and like keep it alive and make sure your hand never talk, touches the ground. Then on fourth and 18, then you have to score <laughs> in order to, um, you know, be in this game. You don't. And then a fumble on the goal line, like, Vikings had a little miracle fairy dust, honestly. I think, um, they but then the, it. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the uh, the Gabe Davis catch, and then the guy that that you had on the Bills sitting on your bench that helped you lose to me. Yeah, this week. Gabe so, Davis. Yeah, Gabe Thanks. Davis. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Last Thanks, one. Andy. Last <laughs> one from Ramaniac at Ramaniac G. It's evaluation time. Spread the snap count. Protect the stars. Got to figure out what you have and what you don't have. Outside of uh, of Tonji, and Tonji, if I'm predict, pr pronouncing your name incorrectly, please send me a DM so I can pronounce it correct on the next one. And Seattle Rams, that was the best. I think it was my favorite one, right? Because now you're in a really, really unique position where you get essentially seven games where you could reevaluate everybody that's on the roster. Like you take a look at every single player. You see who can play who can't play, and your turnover is that much more dramatic for next year. But you're in a position at least next year to be able to fill the cap with players that are under the radar, players that can help contribute, that are supplemental to your overall success and to your core. And that's where I feel like this team will eventually be headed. It's what they've done over the past five, six years. So I just want to see what everybody's got, and then we'll make an evaluation of what we have at the end of the year. Yeah. Williams get him a lot more active. Sure, um, sure. Cam Akers likely gone next year is my thought. Yeah, but can you develop a receiving core? Can you find an offensive lineman in the backup rotation that could start next year? Like, like, got to be looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, you're right because I don't know what else to look for at this point. Yeah, yeah. Treat it like it's the preseason. You're looking for guys who can play and guys who can't play. The guys who can't play will stick out on a bad team very, very quickly. I mean, I just don't know what you tell Aaron Donald right now. Hey, sorry. Yeah, we're going to run it back this year. We suck. Um, we want you to go out there every game, give it 110%, and then next year we're going to try again. Like, it's, That's what it is. It's next year. Yeah, we're going to Yeah, but I, I don't know if you can tell him on that. He might be done. Yeah, I know. I, I That's not a reality that I want to – I want to live in right now. Yeah. You know? All right. Ending on a somber note. Hashtag Monday pain. Indeed. 
what 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 can I do for the rest of the night? Because I'm, I'm going to watch Eagles Commanders. Yeah, you know, tough life. Your team is no good. Go for, go all in on your fantasy squad. Go all in on some of your some of Nick's picks. Like make it fun. You know, yeah. look, for, look for new stuff and get ready for next year. Yeah, yeah. Let's just yeah. Let's find happiness in what we can outside of the football world. You'll find love in a hopeless place, Nick. I know you will. Thank you. <laughs> All right. and, I, and I'm sorry that that Nick's picks this week wasn't great. We'll get into it. <laughs> you have to apologize. It's the risk you take. Yes. Thank you, guys. Peace out. Love you. Horns Peace. up. Go Rams. <laughs>